How's it going ladies and bruces? I'm Bobby Six, Come and welcome to a new series we're going to be doing on Torment. Tides of Numenera. Now this one's been a long time coming. But after the end of Tyranny, I feel like we needed another nice, sizable RPG to sink our teeth into. And this one's been uh, in the works for some time, so I'm looking forward to getting into it. I've played it for about an hour just to see how it records and everything. It seems to do fine. But I don't know exactly what I'm doing, to be honest, but we'll see what we do. So, let's get into it. So this episode is pretty much going to be a character creation episode. I imagine. Just like the first one of Tyranny was. I will be male. Because I am male. Your mind wakes in darkness. Aching cold sets into an unfamiliar body. A distant howling surrounds you, louder with each passing second. Insistent and invisible hands slap and tear at the membrane that protects you. Your first emotion is an involuntary and formless panic. You feel you have forgotten something, something important. As if it once meant the world to you, but the details slip away as you grasp at them. You force your eyes open. Uh, look around? A white pink fleshy cocoon surrounds you. Even as you look, a minor rent in its side tears open, and the howling wind forces its way inside. The cocoon rips away, gone before you can grab it, spinning you into a dizzying tumble. You are falling, the world many kilometers beneath you. You catch a glimpse of a curved horizon, and also the ground beneath you that is approaching deceptively quickly. Above you, a small moon is slowly collapsing in upon itself. A corona of acid green and black energy playing around its edges. The wind buffets you and burns your eyes, but you don't need to see the details of the faraway ground to know you're in serious trouble. You won't survive a fall from this stratospheric height. A part of your frantic mind babbles that technically you probably fell from a thermospheric height. You struggle to stay focused as the ground rushes toward you. The voiceovers are very nice. That's scary, are we gonna die already? Look at the horizon. You are spinning too rapidly to get a good look. You can see a large landmass, a vast body of water directly below you, and scattered archipelagos. But the detail eludes you. A deep black night is above you, its nocturnal clarity disappearing as the haze of atmosphere envelops you. Uh, try to remember what happened? It's, it's hazy. You were in a tall passageway, its sides slicked with dew. The air warm and moist, as if you were caught in the breath of a giant organism. You remember fleeing in fear and exhilaration, laughing through the terror. What was it that pursued you? Something ancient and cold, its coiling power the promise of oblivion. Its shadowed tendrils struck at you, and the walls where they landed were torn apart utterly, destroyed beyond any hope of repair. You leapt into a membranous cocoon and fell from the... the station? The moon? And then, you were empty. But who were you? What was that creature? A word surfaces in your thoughts, and you seize it before it vanishes. Sorrow. The world fills your sight. You're about to hit. Oh, shit. I want to remember the sorrow, but I should probably try and not die. Try to stop the fall one last time. You're still plummeting. If it's any consolation, the dizzying fall will be over shortly. You see a small glassy dome inside the littered bay, two figures outside it. One of them points his arm at you and a riot of colors tangles your fall, slowing you, but not enough. You crash into the building, and as your consciousness winks out, you hear the sounds of the structure collapsing around you, and then, darkness. Ah, oh, we're alive. Hooray. I thought we were dead. Already. That would have sucked. Move, yep. Yeah. And right, yep. Yeah. Interact, cool. What is this thing? Jumbled thoughts cloud your head as you study the empty bowl before you. Drops of liquid fall from the ceiling, splattered on the ground next to the bowl. The light from every drop is reflected in the bowl's rounded hollow, as if it hungers for that light and needs to be filled. Yet the bowl remains dry. Another drop falls from the ceiling and splashes across the pylons, wasted. Might carefully move the bowl beneath the liquid. 
Three stat pulls, might speed and intellect that you can use to increase your chances. Okay. So that increases our percentage. 85%? Done. Ow! Edges of the bowl tear at your flesh as you seize it. You grit through the pain, though, falling the bowl over the glowing pool of fallen light. Took one damage. Ow. Dicks! My first challenge and I fail. Not a good start. <laughs> not a good start. An, an expected start, but not a good start. Blood trails from your fingers into the hungry depths of the bowl. Drop by drop it fills. Your blood mixing with the light until the air itself takes on a strange reddish hue. Ripples spread over the blurred outline of your reflection. A sanguine radiance spills across the segmented floor, washing away the nearest shadows and pouring into your mind, melting the ragged edges of your fragmented thoughts. You are not whole, not yet, but you have begun to heal from the damage done in your long fall. A voice calls out from somewhere high above, beyond the reaches of the spreading light. Hello, are you still alive down there? We're up here. Oh. I don't know whether it's going to be voice acted or not, some of it, so... I'm inclined to, like, hold back on talking, because I don't want to, like, talk over the voice acting. As soon as you touch the orb, a memory floods your mind. You stand in front of a rusted door. The air is humid and dank. You've had a moment's respite from this waterlogged hell. A bubble of stale air your resting point. You've breathed water before, and you've lived decades beneath the waves, but your body's an air breather, and the constant pressure has been crushing you ever so subtly. Worse, your companion's mind seems to be wandering from the task at hand. He's a genius with machines, as you well know, but now he seems distracted. The device in his hands is covered with knobs, wires, and antennae. He believes it can get the two of you through the corroded door, but he's merely staring at it. Perhaps he's lost faith in his invention. But that is hardly your concern. The mission cannot be delayed. It must proceed. Deceive him. Threaten him. Cast a spell to fix the device yourself. Threaten him until he returns to the task at hand. Your shouted words seem muffled in the stale air. Your companion flinches away from you. Sorry, I just wanted to be sure I hadn't made a mistake. He makes minute adjustments to the knobs and blinking levers of the device, and the stale air of your bubble freshens as the door swings open. A dark hallway lies beyond, a passage that links the water-bordered cells and the aquatic viewing areas. What you seek lies there. Moments later, you're underwater again, your hands closing around a strange yet familiar artifact. You need it to complete something. It hovers above a pedestal, rotating in the dark water. An electric current runs through your fingers, as your hand crosses the vertical plane of the pedestal and an iridescent field coalesces so fast that the waves of pressure daze you for a moment. The rising pulse of a sonar alarm ripples through the water. The guards won't be far behind. Run. You can come back for it. Disable the sonar pulse. Use a device to stop them. One of the ciphers in your belt. Uh, disable the sonar pulse. You focus on the cloudy base of the pedestal. Your fingers instinctively find the control panel for the jeweled force field. Almost as if you'd built it in the first place. You remove it, casting it to the side, and you reach inside to deactivate the crystals that power both the pulse and the pedestal. As you remove them, a scaly hand falls on your shoulder. Your head, head whips around and you see only the inky blackness of a piscine eye. The memory begins to fade, as if you have been drawn backward through a tunnel, and you hear more pylons rising from the pit. Something is wrong. The events within this orb have settled into a gap in your mind, but the edges of it are rough, as though the memory itself is not truly yours. There's something else. A gust of sour air pulling at you, like a predator inhaling the scent of its prey at the far end of dark, whispering field. What on earth is going on? This wavy ground is awesome. And terrifying. Also terrifying. We got tab to look at stuff? Oh, we do. Sweet. That's just like, uh, Tyranny. It's built in the same engine as Tyranny, I believe. You stand beside a woman on a verdant crag. Beneath the two of you is a broad plateau towering above the overgrowth far below. 
Strange machines have been built into the cliffside, presumably for reconnaissance or defence. A metallic disc gleams from the centre of the plateau. Your self-aware humanoid machines drill at the base of the cliffs below. If you were looking for a sanctuary, and you were, desperately, this seems like the right place. I don't know about this, the woman says, her voice flat, neutral, her face is turned away from you. What makes this place any more secure than the other ones we've found? What do we got? Draw her attention to the hidden details of your more experienced eye. Use the charm to persuade her of the merits of the site, convince her with the wisdom of your superior intellect. Uh, let's say experienced eye. You shade your eyes against the bright sun so that you can point out the thin bands radiating out from the metallic disc. How the energy from those bands affect the local fauna, suggesting an enormous source of prior world energy. She thinks deeply. It's geologically sound? Have you run the sound sampling and checked the strata? No major caverns or weaknesses showed up on your resonance scans? She waits for your affirmation and says, Alright, I'm convinced. The two of you sketch your plans for the sanctuary, drawing schematics and architectural diagrams. Then you descend into a plateau to examine the open ground. The woman suggests having one of the servitors build a shelter for your time here. You try to draw one of your constructs away from its task, but it doesn't respond to your voice. When you lay a hand on its shoulder to reinforce your command, it whirls and strikes you in the face with inhuman speed. It turns back to its task, ignoring you. Your companion helps you rise, laughter in her eyes. It seems your construct has other ideas. What's the matter with it? Use the Numenera integrated in the Construct's body to overwhelm the behavior malfunction. Examine the Construct for mechanical defaults. Ah, uh, faults, sorry. Look for a deeper solution. The Construct for mechanical faults? Everything re resolves into sharp focus. And you see that the servitor's rear actuators are corrupted. You dig into the Construct's back. It seems not to mind as long as you don't interfere with its task. Definitely, you reset the actuators and see the energy spark into disused portions of the Construct's brain. The construct resumes its work, and this time it listens when you speak to it. Acknowledged. It obediently trundles to the site of your new shelter. The image freezes, then fades, and you feel the memory filling the gap in your mind. Block by jagged block, you stagger, clutching your head. Reclaiming your memories hurts. And once more, there's something else. Hairs lift, one by one, on the back of your neck. Something beyond this room can sense what you are doing, and is hunting you. Scary. We're glowing and shit. That's us reclaiming our memories, huh? Does look unpleasant, I'll give you that. A vision of a city springs up around you. Your city, in flame, flames and under attack. Her defenders have fought and died all day, and still the attackers keep coming. They fight as if your destruction were demanded of them. They care nothing for mercy, surrender or plunder. What they want is blood. But you have brought a keen-eyed companion to the top of the tower. She has seen the way you stop the invaders. You need to get her to safety. And you need to rally your defenders. But even if, as you turn toward the door of the tower, two of the attackers descend from a hovering machine. You don't have, to have time to strike at them before they land. One is brutishly large, his weapon a vibrating axe. The other is slim, sheathed in glassy armor and holding a hilt with a sizzling invisible blade. Your companion backs away. She's too young to help. Your enemies advance single file, confined by the parapet. Trade blows with the giant, you can handle it for at least a strike or two. Duck under the giant's swing and attack before he can strike. Fight defensively and figure out who presents the greater threat. Um, yeah, let's go trade blows with the giant. The giant's first two attacks are blurs. You block the first strike, but the second forces you to your knees. Though you're dazed and your vision is hazy, your armor holds, and you keep your wits about you. Enough that when he raises the great axe above his head to finish you, you are able to bury your blade under his breastplate. The blade emerges from the back of his neck, and his life's blood washes over your hands. He falls, taking your weapon with him, and his companion attacks. Her invisible blade is far more lethal than the giant's axe. You duck as she thrusts at you, and the wall behind you hisses, destroyed. Her return swing cuts through your armor, ruining your breastplate. She doesn't have to be skilled with a weapon like this, she just has to make contact. You time your attack, just as she pulls back for another strike. You barrel into her, driving her over the wall, and she drops screaming to the ground 50 meters below. The immediate threat ended, 
You focus on finding a way back to your allies. You open the tower door and rush down the stairs. The door at the base of the stairs is slightly cracked, opening just a bit into the hall, and you hear more of the enemy soldiers beyond. Hurl yourself against the door and knock them to the ground. Crack the door open to sneak past them. Charge through them, counting on your defences to protect you. Uh, let's hurl ourselves against the door and knock them to the ground. Let's be proactive. You charge through the dim shadows, dropping your shoulder into the door at the last minute. It bursts open. Halfway through its arc, it crashes into a pair of enemy soldiers, scattering them. You race, ha you race through the door, blade in hand, and you dispatch your stunned foes before they have a chance to move. Their blood begins to pool in the hallway. The memory begins to fade. You find yourself back in your own body. Your temples throb with the racing force of your heartbeat. And the reclaimed memories blaze within you like a bonfire on a mountain peak. Visible to every predator for kilometers around. A tremor rocks the floor beneath you as the massive fist has struck the room itself. Swaying on your feet, you see frantic movement within the borders of a mirror at the edge of the room. So I assume that was all to choose what kind of character I'm going to be playing. Whether I'm going to be like a tank or a mage or a DPSer. That's how it looks anyway. The border of the mirror is lavishly decorated with dizzying number of interlocked symbols. Daggers, masks, paintbrushes, amulets and more. But nothing compared to what you see in the glass. You see a vast crowd of people. Exact doppelgangers of you. Shoving, arguing with and fighting each other. Most are drab imitations of you. But a precious few are vivid, and you pull and pull at your attention. Each of them bears an intricate pentagonal tattoo on their head. In their eyes, their actions, you see the memories you discovered within the orbs and the choices you made, shining like distant stars, your hand twitches at your side. And though some of the bright doppelgangers ignore you, an even smaller number immediately turn to you, ready for you to choose them and learn what you might become. A rumble shakes the room and a slow vibration spreads from the darkness below, rippling the, towards the ceiling. Point at the strong doppelganger shoving its way through the group. Point at the hulking doppelganger with wrath in its eyes. I like that one. The hulking doppelganger with wrath in its eyes. Whirling a club with brutal grace, the doppelganger clears a path through the crowd and stomps towards the mirror. It glowers at you, then bashes the club against the ground and roars in your face. The doppelganger growls, waiting for your decision. Yes, that is who I am. The remaining doppelgangers scatter for the edges of the mirror and vanish. Your chosen identity steps forward. Its appearance, cha appearance changes as it steps out of the rippling glass. Its body becomes stronger, more supple. Shadows of several weapons flicker in and out of its hand, and different kinds of armor shimmer on its body. You get the feeling it, you, would be, more, would be comfortable with all of them. The word glaive sounds in your mind. Game descriptor, Wrathful. Your doppelganger continues walking, stepping into you, filling you, making you whole. Your decision rings out in the cavernous room, awakening and unlocking vast mechanisms beyond the walls. Suddenly a grotesque noise rings through your shared worlds, like a bell, if bells could rot. Something is coming. Restored one health and two might. Ooh. The mirror fades, leaving a dark open doorway. You take a deep breath and step through. Character creation. Your choices in the memories and the mirror have begun to build your character, but now you have the opportunity to decide on a number of details. First, you can decide to change your type. Type defines the abilities and skills you'll be able to acquire as you advance. Okay, so what do we got? Wrathful Glaive. So Glaive is Warrior. Jack is like Rogue. And Nano is like Mage. Yeah. Alright, Glaive's good for me then. Um, we got opportunist and practiced in armor. Oh, intimidation, heavy weapons, and smashing. Heavy weapons? Two-handed melee weapons or cannon-like ranged weapons. Oh. So we're going to build a, ca a character just like our tyranny character, I guess. Stat pools of resources you can apply. Use to apply effort or active abilities. You can distribute points as you see fit. Glaives tend to favor might and or speed, while nanos tend to favor intellect. Jacks usually benefit from a balanced set of points. Oh, Jack, like Jack of all trades. Let's just pour it into Might. I'm pretty happy with that. Let's just move on. 
Abilities unlocked by your type can be active actions, such as attacks or spell-like esoteries, or unique passive effects. So we get to pick one. Unfailing precision, plus 10% critical strike chance on weapon attacks. Is that passive? I assume that's passive. Skill with defense. Plus 10% evasion, plus 10% willpower. Is that passive as well? Hook. Snare a target with a grappling hook and pull them towards you. Awesome. That's so cool. Taunt. Yeah, I don't want to really be a tank. I kind of like the skill to defense though. So I can be semi-tanky, semi dps -y. Let's go with skill to defense. I like that. Most skills increase your chance of success on specific kinds of actions and tasks, but some give other passive bonuses. Each skill starts at the novice level and can be increased to trained and specialized, granting greater bonuses to each level. Descriptors often leave some skills with the two red inability level, meaning they inflict penalties. When upgraded, these return to novice level. Yeah. In other words, they're not even worth it. So what do we got? Endurance, quick fingers, smashing and running. What's smashing do? The fi <laughs> finally honed ability to break things. Done. Do you have any more points? Is that just the one? Did we just get the one point? Looks like it. Cool. Weapon skills increase the character's chance to hit with a specific kind of weapon. Like other skills, they start at novice. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Cool. So heavy weapons is two-handed melee and cannon ranged weapons. Uh, medium is crossbows, rifles, single-handed melee weapons. Destruct true. Ooh, I kind of like that. Ranged. Crossbows, pistols, firearms, uh, light, yeah. Melee, swords, axes, or mace. Can I want medium weapons? I don't want cannon like ranged weapons. I'd rather have like, like, I like rifles. Rifles are my favorite. Can I undo a point there? No, I can't. Yeah. Well, that's a pain. Although you chose your descriptor from among many doppelgangers in the mirror, you now have the chance to view your specific bonuses and penalties at grants. You can also examine what effects of the other descriptors and choose a new one if you wish. Okay, sweet. So maybe we can fix that up. I don't want heavy weapons. Smashing's nice. What's this? Perception and stealth. Persuasion and deception. Intellect. Two speed. Two intellect. No. No. Machinery and concentration. Mystical and cipher use. Perception and concentration. Endurance. Natural skill and plus two resistance. Persuasion and quick fingers. No. Strong. Th plus three might. Plus one intimidation, plus one endurance, minus quick fingers, minus intellect. That sounds pretty good. I like that. Strong willed? No. No. Yeah. Let's just go with strong. I like strong. Okay, strong glaive. Can we get back? What does that endurance actually do? Plus five health per level. Inability decreases health by two. Okay. Yes. I knew it was going to be a whole episode of creating a character. It always is. What the fuck is going on here? Are you the doppelgangers? Spectre. Everything about the spectral figure seems dreamlike. He is a hazy silhouette who seems to be made of blue glass smoke. He wears stylish, well-cut clothes. His handsome, bearded face seem hauntingly familiar, though you've never seen him before. He breathes a sigh of relief when he sees you. We weren't sure that would work. We pulled our strength and channeled it through me to reach you, to wake you up. He glances at the other figures here and frowns unhappily. It took more out of them than we thought. The other reflections, they're more like shadows now. Look, I'll bet you got a lot of questions. This whole place is basically your mind. Your body's still out in the real world, healing from that fall. You need to get out there and finish the process, he shrugs. It shouldn't be too hard. Before I met you, I felt like something was hunting me. Do you know what it was? He closes his eyes. That's... That's a memory I don't want to recall. Large. Black. Furious. It's our death. It's... The sorrow. He closes his eyes. I hope it's lost interest in you. If it finds us, we're done for. 
You said I had to finish the process. What do you mean by that? After you wake up from this dream state and attune to the tides, you'll need to find something called a resonance chamber. Your body should have landed somewhere near it. Just climb inside that and everything will be fine. What do you mean attune to the tides? Tides are like a force, like gravity or magnetism or something. Except they respond to people's actions and perceptions. Your body, that is. Your body in the real world needs the tides to survive. It's not something you need to worry about. Your body will attune as it wakes up. What's a resonance chamber? I remember pieces about it, but not the whole. It's a crystal sarcophagus. I remember it having five mechanical arms around it and a metal ring set in the floor. I think we... We were aiming for it when we fell. When you open your eyes in the real world, it should be nearby. Who are those other people? You called them reflections. That's what they are. As I said, it's your mind. You'll find ref reflections of people you knew, people you met in the real world, and with whom you shared some kind of psychic connection. I don't know how or why, it just happens. If this place is my mind, why don't I remember any of this, any of you? It's your mind, a construct built to, I don't know, share thoughts? Store your true self? Wait, you know how people say, in the first place? This is definitely the first place of your memory. Well, it's the first place for me anyway. You'd probably know better since it's yours. If you don't remember now, maybe it'll come to you later. Who are you? I'm... He pauses and looks down at himself, considering a long time before answering. I'm you. I'm a part of your mind, a splinter. I was waiting here for you. We called you, with the memories of the others who are here. I... I don't know what happened next. How do you know all this? All that you're telling me? He throws up his hands in frustration. I'm just a part of you. I look at you, and I know. This place was made for you, for us. And I remember pieces of knowledge that come to me when you ask your questions, but that's all. So how do I get back to the real world? There's a portal down there. It'll take you back to your body. Just step through it, and the whole tides thing should take care of itself. He crosses his arms. When you wake up, find the resonance chamber and activate it. Then we can... What the hells was that? Oh, fucking hell. Tentacle monster. Gods, it's the sorrow. Oh, he broke the mirror. The sorrow is anchored to those reflections. It's devouring their power. We have to get rid of them, destroying its anchors, or else the sorrow will erase us forever. Crisis initiated. Kill the reflections anchored in the sorrows of your mind. A crisis begins when you enter a dangerous situation. Crises are turn-based encounters where you can fight, sneak, manipulate the environment, or talk your way out of trouble. I don't think I can talk my way to this thing out of trouble. Each turn you can take one action, or move to an... Wait. Each way you can take one action to attack or activate an ability, you can also make one move. So it's like XCOM then, or Divinity. That reflection near you, kill it. You'll loosen the sorrow's anchor. Shit just got nasty. Use an attack. Use the left mouse button to attack the enemy. We'll move to position. Try clicking the highlighted character now. If it can be applied to increase your chances. Okay, so... One plus four. Sorry, it's ten. Oh, Jesus. What are those? What in the... It's escaping. It's gonna hide inside your mind. Now run, get to the next one. Okay. You can sacrifice your attack for the turn to double move instead of attacking. Okay. So it requires a double move. Sora's turn. Stop spawning squid monsters. Alright, let's kill him. Increase the damage you deal, yeah, yeah. Sorry about the, uh... Sorry about still reading out the tutorials, but... I'm pretty new to it, so... Uh, yeah, we're gonna have to do the tutorials, otherwise I'm... Worried I'm gonna make a huge fuck-up. What's it doing now? It's... It's infecting it somehow. 
Fettles are temporary conditions or status effects that can improve or reduce a character's stats. The Sorrow just placed a fettle on the remaining reflection. You can't remove this fettle, but you may find a way to overcome it. Meaning what? It'll be harder to kill him, I guess? Whack him. Full blast. The armor stat reduces physical damage. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's too... His armor's too high for you to overcome with your unarmed attack. The reflection is protected somehow. You need to find a way to hit it even harder. Ow. Grab that piece of mirror glass. It might have enough residual energy to kill the reflection. Okay. That one. Loot. Click on it. Yeah, yeah. And then take all, yeah? Thank you. Cool. Is that immediately equipped? Or do I have to equip it? Click. To activate an item, left click on it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Is it our turn now? Is it equipped? Boom! Yay, we did it! We are the greatest. You pried it loose. That thing is a cancer, an infection. It's unstoppable, but you stopped it. He holds his head in his hands. I can't believe it found us in here. He looks at you, terror in his eyes. That thing? The sorrow? It's been hunting you. It's what killed you in the first place. It'll keep hunting you until you activate the resonance chamber. I didn't. I didn't remember until I saw it, but that's why the chamber is so important. You have to get back and activate the chamber before it's too late. The portal to your body is that shimmering dome there. Go, now! Okay. Let's go. Where did he fall from? His body smashed to talk. It's a wonder he's still breathing. All I saw was the corona, not his origin point. But look, he's healing already. Spontaneous regeneration. We you look at... Wait, I know that face. Haha, <laughs> you fell over. Oh, what was that? What'd you do? Calistige? His tone has become accusatory, suspicious. You open your eyes. The first thing you notice is the man's kaleidoscope of tattoos writhing across his forearms. He wears a long dark coat, belted at the waist. Supplies filling the pockets. His boots are worn and stained with years of travel. You blame me? He emitted an internal physiolo physiological reaction in response to the fall. Probably related to that fantastic healing process. Obviously. Elegurn. Her voice rolls and hisses, and you have to rub your eyes to be sure you're not seeing double. Faint echoes of her actions trail from her, each nearly mimicking her, though some act and react to stimuli that you can't perceive. Her vivid hair and outrageous clothing remain, remain constant through the shadows. Oh yes, it's obvious, Calistige. His voice is grim and clipped. Then he sees you looking at him. You're no ordinary mortal. We know that much. Start talking. His face is hard and set. I'm no ordinary mortal? What do you mean? You really don't know? He cocks his head to the side. I'm starting to think you're not him. Starting to think, Elegun? Tell me, is it a novel experience? <laughs> it's his face. I've never seen any other people rebuild themselves like that. Only the changing god could possibly have healed so quickly. He sighs and rubs his face, trying to regain his composure. Maybe you could help me for a change. You know what this means to me? You're familiar with the word changing, Elegun. It implies inconsistency. Thus, the changing god may well have changed. Several versions of her shrug and she, as she addresses you. You'll have to forgive him. He believes you're someone he once knew. Even though it's painfully obvious to anyone that you were, a new, you were newly born. Her most solid self-courtesies. While others bow or spin. I and my sisters am Calistige. This is Elegurn. We are explorers. Knowledge seekers. That's how we came to be in this room. If I'm not mistaken, you are what we call a cast-off. The changing god created you. Body and mind. Your sire used your body for a time, then abandoned it for reasons of his own. When his mind departed for a new experience, you were born in his cast-off shell. Where are we? What is this place? 
a sanctum of your sires, the common belief is he has several places throughout the ninth world, possibly other worlds as well. We were only just able to gain entry to this one because of your grand entrance. Who was the changing god? Ha! There's something coming from you. She gives him a sidelong glance. The changing god is your sire, dear. He discovered a path to immortality long ago. A means to transfer his self to a new body of his own creation. I don't think he knew, however, that when he abandoned one body, another mind was birthed to fill the void. Oh, he knew all right. He eyes you up and down coldly. The only thing the changing god cares about is himself. He doesn't give a single thought for those he leaves behind. Are there other cast-offs? Dozens. Hundreds. Who could say? Your sire has been doing this for several centuries. Though if all of them were born the way you claim to have been, it's a wonder any of them survive. You, so you say I was born when the changing god left, but why am I not dead? I used a cipher to slow your fall further, but the damage still would have killed an ordinary person. But think about it, if you're the kind of person who can make your body into anything you want, what do you do? If you constructed bodies for centuries, you want to make each one better than the last. You want to live forever. You're, going to let your li you're not going to let your life end by accident. No, you'll make strong bodies, fast, powerful. Maybe throw in regeneration while you're at it. The changing God has always been vain. He really stays in, long in a shell that doesn't suit his self-image. She looks you up and down, his smile suddenly unnerving. Perhaps the changing god fled because he didn't want to wear those scars of yours. What was the blast of energy when I woke? As I was telling my colleague, it was obviously a physiological reaction of some kind. I've never witnessed the birth of, birth of a cast-off, but yes, it could very well have been caused by your nascent consciousness. Don't worry, I don't believe it caused any real harm. Not to me, at least. Really, you've been more abrasive than ever since we came in here. He shoots her a sidelong look. She just can't empathize with other people unless she's experimenting on them. Do you know anything about the tides? I've heard the term before. A subject your sire studied in great depth. I'm afraid it isn't my field of inquiry. Are you sure the surge didn't hurt you? If it did, it was damaged in our minds. Though how you'd check if it cocked her, I couldn't say. Tough to find normalcy there. At least we know it didn't hurt Alagoon. That skull's as thick as an organic stone. Uh, talk about something else? Before I woke, I was in some kind of dreamlike labyrinth with a glowing spectre. With how hard you hit the ground, I'm surprised that's all you saw. If falling from the sky didn't kill me, is there anything that can? An excellent question. Having seen your regenerative abilities in action, I suspect they are primarily physical. A regrowth. If that's the case, you'd be unable to survive most varieties of phys psychic or molecular decomposition, disintegration, conflagration, and so forth. Degenerative diseases could pose a problem, and I know of several entities capable of psychic destruction. As she speaks, a vision flashes in your mind. It's not yours exactly. Somehow you know this is a memory of the changing gods. You're in a dark room, lit by a myriad of blinking lights and holograms from many machines surrounding you. What about a body that w can withstand the sorrow's attacks, said a voice. It seems to be coming from one of the machines. No, you reply. The thing has no respect for, our, for barriers of any kind. Physical, temporal, psychic. This is the only way. With a series of gestures, you bring up an image of a crystalline pod. If the resonance chamber works, it'll give us the power to stop the sorrow's hunt once and for all. We just need the right focal point, a catalyst. The memory fades. Calisterge is t still talking. You realize that the device you saw in your memory is an identical one behind you now. It looks just like the spectre had described it, a transparent sarcophagus inside a crystalline dome with mechanical arms arraying around it on a metal ring. Unfortunately, the dome is shattered. The sarcoph sarcophagus is cracked and one of the arm is in pieces on the floor. Whatever its function, it clearly needs repair. Or flesh-eating viruses, one presumes disfigurement by the iron wind would likewise be devastating enough to... I think he gets the point, Calistage. I saw a vision of myself in another time and place just now. You didn't see it too, did you? I saw you stare into space while Calistage graphically described all the ways you could die, but that's about it. He snorts. I only noticed because I did the same thing. 
Do either of you know anything about the sorrow? I've had my share of sorrows, but never the sorrow. What's that? A disease? Your mouth compresses in a tight line. I know nothing about it. Do either of you know how to fix the crystal chamber there? Elegant chuckles. The infirm and certain says, not likely. Though it might not be impossible. We need people with the appropriate knowledge. I'm sure the cult of the changing god would hold the answer. Her distaste is evident in the expression of her echoes, although the face of the one in your in the lead remains clearly impassive. You turn to the insane to help a newborn? Where's your judgment, Elagoon? It would take him to the Order of Truth. I would take him to the Order of Truth. The Order of Truth? Are you mad? That would sooner take us apart. Um... Elagoon, would you take me to the Cult of the Changing God? A wise choice. Your worshippers aren't likely to cut you apart. And they're sometimes fools, but they collect knowledge and data. They'll tell you more than you care to know about. Whoever you are, they could give you good counsel. She sniffs and gives Elagoon an acid glare. Good counsel? The best counsel is to come with me. I'll accompany the two of you. When you change your mind, you'll need an introduction to the Order of Truth. Fine, we'll both go. Don't be surprised when Callisturge leaves you broken in a ditch with your purse empty. While she laughs it off as a good experiment. Suspicious as always, Elagoon. Child, the world is an exciting place, but it is full of dangers. Rest assured, one of us will get you safely where you need to be. I'll be right behind you. A sunny smile crosses her face. Alright, let's go. Gain some companions, blah, blah, blah. Yeah, okay. Okay, we're going to end this episode here because it's going on way too long. Like, three quarters of an hour at this point. But we got the character creation done and the basic setup. So I hope you guys enjoyed it. We'll be back at this very shortly. Thank you guys for watching. Thanks for hanging out with me and I'll see you in the next one.